Hey folks, welcome to CFO Chat. As always, any co-production happens, you have all the detail here. Safaricom has released sterling HY numbers. We are privileged to have the CFO, Dilip. Always a pleasure to sit down with you, man. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Dilip, I must start by saying congratulations on the numbers. I just checked the markets. The share prices are open 10% up. And uh, let's start from here, Dilip. When you look at the top line, um, in my own analysis, looking back historically, it looks like this is a set of results that definitively says all the overlays and the hangover we have from COVID-19 seems to be finally behind us. Because previously it's been a bit up and down. This one looks quite resilient upwards. Do you share a similar assessment? Okay, so let me uh, start by saying that we're very happy uh, to see the, the set of results that we have just released. Um, and I was presenting, uh, there was a slide that I presented if you look at the ups and downs over the last five years, um, and then what you see now, you could almost say that we are beginning to see um, a positive trajectory. Yeah, you had COVID, and then uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID, and of course the the macroeconomic challenges, Russia, Ukraine war. All of that has some impact. Now, if you are asking me whether are we behind all of this, no, I don't think we are behind. Or uh, you know. And we start seeing that uh, customers uh, are going to spend a lot more money than they were doing before because customer wallets are still uh, stressed. But we did a quite a bit of work in over a long period of time, building capability, building new businesses, expanding our services that we offer to our customers, and that showing up. Yeah, that showing up in the the, the key revenue streams uh, that uh, we have grown in this uh, half year. We've seen that um, very strong MPESA performance. Um, of course, we had uh, uh, reintroduction of uh, the charge, you know, the, the, the M-Pesa to bank, bank to M-Pesa. That, of course, helped us. But remember, this is also in the context of we have reduced the prices by almost half. Yeah? But the volume, the customers found it so easy for them to use this uh, channel. The volumes have grown so high despite a reduction in prices, despite reduction in volume, we still have grown in that area. So 16.5%. Um, just uh, outstanding performance from M-Pesa. Mobile data shaping up very well, 12.5% yeah. as you see. Uh, the usage is now 3.8 gigabits per customer per month. I still remember when I came in in uh, November 2020, we were about uh, a, a gig per customer per month. So you almost like, in three years time, it has gone by four times. Yeah? Yes. And still a lot to cover in terms of the 4G devices. People are still using 2G devices. So. Very strong story on, um, on, on on mobile data as well. And fixed, shaping up very well. We still have a lot of work to do in the enterprise space. The home is really, really uh, doing well. 30% growth year over year, quite commendable. And don't miss out messaging revenue. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes, you know, because it's a small revenue, but we still have 20 million customers, active customers on a 30-day basis who use messaging. messaging. Yeah. And uh, that has grown 6%, and which line was on a declining, yeah. Within M-Pesa, I just wanted to highlight, I think this also came up on all line items are growing, except lending, yeah. But we know why it is, you know, our, what we are doing is that we want to broaden the base, make it affordable, so that more and more customers can use and at an affordable price. That's why we did the price optimization in Fuliza uh, last year by almost 50%. That's what is resulting into a revenue decline. But if you exclude Fuliza, uh, we are growing, we are growing over 20% in the rest of the lending businesses. So with merchant credit coming in and, you know, and, and, and the buy now, pay later, and um, potentially um, a credit marketplace at some point in time, I think we're going to grow in the lending space as well. Dilip, on the MPESA discussion, I think one of the, um, the, really the sweet spots in these numbers is the fact of the growth in the chargeable transactions up by double digits, huge volumes you're looking at here. But the question I have for you is this, is this a one-off given the reinstatement of tariffs or do you see yourselves being able to replicate this kind of growth in the chargeable transactions? It's interesting that you asked this question and uh, I'm, I'm, I have to admit that this question comes up quite often in terms of when you see um, the chargeable transactions growth even in the last two to three years. My, my take on this is that it's fundamental to what you're trying to drive. Have more use cases for customers, allow them to use more one more services, 
which allows them to do one more transactions. And that's what is driving. We have 30 to 33 million uh, active customers, you know, 30 day active MPESA customers. So one more transaction, one more services uh, leads to this. Now, pre-COVID, three years back, we were about eight to 10 transactions per customer per month. The question at that time was, are you going to grow from that level, right? So because of our past success, sometimes there is this feeling that, oh, are you guys going to grow? And there are questions that I have to face. Is financial services going to grow double digit uh, in the future? Yes, but we have delivered. We have delivered consistently double digit growth. Our CAGR on uh, M-Pesa financial services has been over 12% yeah, for five years more on so. So it's just a testimony of the fact that we have more services, more opportunities for customers to use our services, and therefore one more transactions leading to the growth that we've seen. So yes, it is very much organic. To some extent, it got uh, also uh, positively uh, uh, impacted by the return to charging or reintroduction of the charges. But we believe that it's sustainable. So it's not, yeah, it's sustainable. And m are now at 42% uh, of the revenue, service revenue pie. Um, Indicatively, do you have in your mind a threshold where you'll begin to say, perhaps we are bordering on concentration risk here? No, that's a good question. You know, from a, if you are talking about concentration risk in the context of um, uh, the, 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 the type of business that we run, uh, my take on this, don't look at M-Pesa as a 42, yes, it is a 42% of service revenue. But within that, M-Pesa has also different set of business, as I was talking I was giving update on our, say, uh, international remittance business, just just two percent. Our lending business is about six percent of M-Pesa. Yeah, so within M-Pesa also there are businesses that you need to look at. They have an opportunity to grow, right? So we cannot combine everything in financial services and say there is a con concentration risk. We have to see that are we developing new areas of business, like, for example, um, uh, we had the merchant credit, which you didn't have before, right? Now, is there a concentration risk there? So you have to see concentration risk in the context of business and the solutions that you are providing. So to that extent, uh, I don't see that it's a, it's, it's a concentration risk. Um, we are, you know, it's, it's growing. We are very happy about it. It's not that the other side has not grown. We have delivered on the core side, outside of FS also, a very good growth in this first half. So I don't believe that it's a concentration risk. And now that you have full control of M-Pesa, how does that change, if at all it does, the strategic outlook for that business line? So, on M-Pesa, I think you referred to the M-Pesa holding company, the Absolutely. Trust, which, yeah. Uh, so, basically it was a Kenyan company um, based out of uh, Kenya. And it, it's that Trust holds the money for all the uh, uh, customers of M-Pesa, right? So, the ownership of this was with Vodafone, which you have uh, brought it back now it's everything is within Safaricom so it allows you have to have more visibility it allows you to have more control because uh, through trustees and board of trustees uh, this is uh, now being run so is it going to materially change the way we run no I don't think so what will enable is for us to have more visibility about how the money that customers has in, a, in their wallet is safeguarded. So that's what it brings in. It, it's not necessarily anything commercial way is going to help us. It's just to make sure that our primary objective is to make sure that money is secured, safe, uh, that there is no way. But in any case, the money was lying here in the banks and the treasury bills, and it still remains here. It's just that management of that, there is an oversight and overview that Safaricom is now doing, which was to be done by Vodafone before. Yes. Dilip, retiring the... Um the USD facility, bridge facility for the Ethiopian investment, I think was a very bold decision, uh, considering the environment we're operating in. Maybe could you just walk us through the thinking around arriving at that as being the optimal solution, given the FX headwinds that are in the market? No, that's a good question, uh, Julian. And we, we were debating, you know, what should we do? And typically, you know, USD loan comes at a cheaper rate, but you run the risk of uh, the, the depreciation, yeah, the currency risk. That's a big risk in any foreign denominated loans. As we have started seeing uh, the 
depreciation and, and dollar becoming stronger and stronger, we were taking many initiatives, including trying to see, you know, how can we minimize our foreign currency exposure? Uh, and we were looking for opportunities to make sure that we don't carry it for longer. Yeah? So we planned it and we executed, but it is very bold for us to be able to say, we haven't crossed even one year from the time we did the, uh, the syndication and then we repaid. So the payment period was for five years. Uh, but that was required, you know, otherwise the exposure, the way you've seen the 22% depreciation in shilling, it would have costed us more. So we evaluated that and took a very bold step. I mean, beyond that also you are trying to do is more and more uh, localization, you know, buy, and, uh, buy more locally, you know, don't pay, not, you know, don't pay in dollar. In yeah. currency. So there is, there is a whole piece around how do you manage the foreign currency exposure. You may have noticed we have upgraded our uh, guidance, but at the same time, we'll see also upgrade our capex <coughs> outlook yes. for the year, right? Yes. So that was also driven by uh, the currency depreciation. That it is costing you more than what it, what it was costing before. So you need to upgrade, or you need to spend um, more uh, for the same things they are doing. Although I think we're still optimized on that. So currency exposure, currency management, and making sure that uh, you know we can minimize our exposure in this area has been a key focus area for our treasury function and uh, I must say they have done a daily, very good job and also looking at what you try to do through the sustainability link loan you have seen that our announcement first time yes. here 15 excellent, billion I think. yeah 15 billion excellent uh, uh, response you know we were looking for 15 billion but you could have actually borrowed 30 billion that was the demand uh, that everybody and the good, good part is that, you know, Safaricom is very much focused on ESG, has been there for forever, right? And that allowed us to see how can we leverage that and also optimize our interest cost. Because if we hit those uh, three KPIs that we agreed, which is one is on carbon emission reduction, um, inclusion and diversity, which is what we are on a great path, and also on digital inclusion, you know. So the 4G devices, more and more hand, uh, affordable 4G devices in the hands of the customer. So we, th we thought that this is in any case our DNA, ASG. So why not use this as an opportunity for us to also reduce our cost of interest because uh, the, the interest cost is lower for the uh, anything that you do on the green side. So banks have huge appetite in this. And I think uh, we know for sure that this is something that we'll always be looking for in future whenever there is a need for funding. Um, we That was $120 million. That's what we... Um, uh, we repaid. Um, that does give us breathing space in terms of keeping one more item in the, our overall fund, the forex exposure. Yeah. So remember, we have supplier who supplies. We 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 import from them. So there isn't one big part of obligation, and then we have the the debt that we take in foreign currency. So it's a substantial part of our. Actually, we are not necessarily our big on foreign currency denominated loan before. So this is the first time we took. So I would say a large chunk of that has gone off. What we are left in the balance sheet, you will see that it's, these are short term. You know, we need for um, you know, typical capex or capital payments, which is falling due, we, we draw a short term dollar loan, but we repay it as soon as the flow comes back, right? So therefore, we are very happy that we don't have anything in the long term uh, debt, and that's not small amount that we repay. But still on the on the debt side, uh, quite some heat on the finance cost side. I'd imagine this reflects really just the, the interest rate risk in the market. Maybe you can comment on, on that and what strategies you have ahead. Um, yeah, that's right. You know, uh, our interest cost has grown uh, by almost fifty percent year over year. Yeah, um, mainly driven by the weighted average cost of interest. So our interest uh, rates are normally fixed with the T bill and then the margin, right, the spread. Um, while we are trying to optimize, and we actually we are able because of our strong balance sheet, we always get a very good spread. But the T bill is what has led us to um, this growth. I mean, the rate has grown almost by 30 percent. Yeah, over a period of time, if you compare that, and of course we we borrowed uh, more money uh, for funding Ethiopia. Uh, and from funding our green initiatives that we have, that also there is a bit of a volume impact, but more importantly, it is the rate impact. Now, 
as I mentioned, I think uh, sustainability lo link loan was one of uh, our key initiative to see where can you reduce our interest rates. Um, sitting down with the banks and see you know what more we can do uh, in terms of um, you know refinancing and looking at a long term, uh, which is more uh, beneficial for us. So we do it all the time as a part of Treasury uh, opportunity. But I must say that um, this is one of the key area of focus for us. It has never happened before in the history of Safaricom that the interest cost has grown up. And it's not by because you have taken more loan. Yes, you have taken loan, but it's mostly driven by the rate of interest. Yeah, absolutely. So um, speaking about Ethiopia, the guidance remains unchanged uh, based on the, uh, the presentation we've seen. And being one year into the um, commercialization of the operations in Ethiopia, I remember at the start of it, Safaricom did indicate that we expect within four years we'll be able to break even. Now with three years left, do you feel you're on course given the numbers that are coming out? Yeah. In the guidance, yes, uh, we, uh, we did mention about Ethiopia guidance remaining same. And it's also coming from our confidence around um, what you can execute in future. So four years, uh, two things we said. We said um, FY24 will be the peak losses um, and then it slides down. And FY26, um, which is two years from now actually, is when we do a bit of break even. Um, with all the commercial momentum that we see, despite all other macroeconomic challenges, we assess to evaluate it and we believe that we'll, we, are, we are on course to achieve that. So FY26, we do a bit of break even and, um, and, and then the next two years is when we really scale up. We are already 2,000 plus uh, base stations, you have seen the numbers. Um, I mean, if you look at those charts, pretty much everything is doubling, you know, if you see the March close number and then and see the September numbers, they are, they, they are in the right track. The, the price levels are low um, and which of course puts pressure on the ARPU but um, um, as we gain more and more customers you will see that voice coming uh, also you know improving the ARPU but mobile data we are doing very well. Mobile data you know we are about 20 percent of revenue in Kenya and we are 69% of revenue in mobile data in Ethiopia. But don't take that number as going forward number, that's how it's going to happen. But we are very pleased the way and also ARPU is also quite good, about 180 shilling. Huh? We are about 240, uh, give and take about 240 shilling in Kenya. And uh, it's just one year operation, we are about 180 in Ethiopia in terms of mobile data ARPU, which is very, very encouraging. I see. And uh, M-Pesa, 1.2 million active subscribers, are you within target, off target, or how is that trending? No, we are within target. Um, and um, as, as, as Peter mentioned, um, we are in that building phase, and also Wim was also talking about that. We are in that building phase where <coughs> uh, all that you are focusing on getting more agents, getting more merchants, and uh, <coughs> allow more customer acquisition. So. Um, the good part is that the acquisition process is same. So any customer who comes in to um, be a GSM subscriber also becomes an M-Pesa customer um, because we started pretty much. You know, so I think that's also going well. On, in terms of customers, yes, we are on track. But in terms of activity, there is still a lot to be done. You know, you you have the customers, but what are they are using it for? Uh, I think we also mentioned about um, trans. If you have not noticed that uh, transactions per customer on active base, it's three. So it's not, you know, we, we need to we need to come a long way to be able to do this. So it's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's it's a huge task ahead. Activity we need to increase more customers, more activities. But I think we're on the right path. Okay. And uh, how are operations in the Amhara region going at the sites back on the last conversation we had? I think uh, there'd been a bit of a halt on that side. And do you feel that Safaricom will hit the target for the number of sites for 2023? Yeah, so confirming to you that Amhara region is still under emergency. Uh, it has not changed and uh, um, which of course um, putting us in terms of a new rollout and also the base stations that um, um, are not necessarily serving customers because uh, there are restrictions on use of certain services there in Hamara region. Now, it's almost 20%, 20% 20, 20 of our 
business there. So 20% of business not getting the right traction, we are not necessarily very happy about it, but what can you do about it? Then we are trying to make sure that the rest of the areas can pick up. So we are um, reallocating resources, we are also looking at um, Tigre region which was um, uh, which, which also went through certain disturbances at quite some time, but it's much peaceful now. So things which are not part of the plan in going to Tigray is also something that we are uh, currently um, accelerating. So it's just a readjustment of where you want to accelerate, maybe slow down on Amhara, but accelerate in some of the areas where you see green shoots. So overall, September, the numbers that you have delivered on track, and we also are very much uh, on track to deliver our FY24 numbers. Uh, whether it is our population coverage yeah. or uh, whether it is the number of sites that you have delivered. Okay. Dilip, uh, we are running uh, really short of time because of uh, your next engagement. But um, I was really impressed by the growth in the merchant numbers, considering the conversation which has dominated this economy that uh, consumers are ditching uh, mobile money for one reason or the other, whether it's cost, whether it's uh, tax visibility. The merchant numbers are up significantly. And uh, sometimes, how do you reconcile these two things? See, convenience drives um, adoption, right? If you, if you make it convenient, um, customers will always come and do what they have to do, right? Um, so for us, I think as an, as an operator, what you can do is allowing that convenience. And merchant acquisition has been um, a, a great story. I mean, if you remember, um, I think three three, four years back, this number was just about 100,000 plus. It was not, you know, I think it was 150,000. Now we are close to 700,000. Yeah, so our target is to go to a million. And merchants are growing, transactions are growing. Yes, there are some, um, what, you, what you could say, some, you know, in the market there are quite a few uh, elements that's going on in terms of the merchants, uh, the, the news that you hear. But so far, I think it, we have been um, we have been successful because it's convenient um, and, uh, and and it's useful for the customers. So, what about future? We still have our target to reach that hit that one million uh, magic mark on merchants. We are on course, um, and um, hopefully the other noises go down by that time. All right. So that aspect never really bothers you in terms of uh, are people really just abandoning these platforms or what's happening? You can't take note of what's happening uh, in the market, right? But that's a very normal and natural reaction to um, what happens. So, again, I'll come back to what is in your control and what is not in your control. Yeah. Um, what is in your control is the propositions, uh, services that you offer. That's what you drive. Now, customer has always have a choice. Remember that. Always have a choice. If they have a choice of not doing what they do today, they will do something different. But for us is make sure that you do the right job, you make sure that it is the propositions are right, make sure that it's convenient for the customers and it is also affordable. That's what we have been driving. So we stay on that course. Dilip, in August, the central bank did approve the raising of MPESA transaction limits to 500,000. I'm curious, I know it's a bit of early days, but how is this showing up in the numbers for MPESA? No, it's a, it's a, it's a very good move, um, especially for the, uh, the small and medium business. Uh, to allow them to transact because those restriction was also putting them into a uh, into a situation where they can't transact M pesa. I think that's uh, it's early days, as you rightly said, but it is we we believe that's the right step. It's a step in the right direction. It's going to uh, enable M pesa uh, for the uh, the small and medium enterprise in a big way. And uh, yeah, numbers are still not available. I'm sure as you come to the end of this year, we'll be able to tell you a little bit more about it, but it's very encouraging. Okay. Let's close this conversation, Dilip. The Safaricom share price, year to date is down about, uh, well, before this market opened today, it was down about 48% by my mouth. And uh, I'm just curious, when you sit as management, does this concern you? Does it uh, really top your priority in terms of what could be happening? So, as a management, um, you can't not take note of the share price. Yeah. Um, are you happy about it? Of course not. Now, what can you do about it? Yeah. So, there is something again. I I like I like to repeat what I uh, I said before. We should know what are the reasons for that. Is it 
coming from performance? Is it coming from performance anxiety or it is coming from other uh, areas? For us to look at that and understand, get the uh, investor sentiment, get the analyst sentiment of what is driving uh, down the share price. I am sure you know it very well that um, the, the, there, is a, there is a concern around macroeconomic environment. It's just not these bourses, I think, um, not just for Kenya, I think in some other countries as well as you uh, are observing. Then you try to see it, what are the things that we can do. Um, I think on performance side is what is definitely within the control of management and also tell the story to the investors and let's to give them the confidence, are we on the right track? Are you delivering what you are promising? So that's I think is a bigger concern and bigger uh, area of focus. So that's what we focus on as a management on a day-to-day -day basis. Because you can't be seeing every day the share prices start thinking about, oh, what's going on? We are worried because share shareholders are the one who have put in money. They have the confidence in our management. They have the confidence in our ability to execute our plan. And we need to make sure that we meet their expectations. So management is trying to do what management should be doing. And of course, and try and tell the story in a way that we deliver performance. And as you know, it's not necessarily coming out of performance. There is also another conversation around, are we on track in Ethiopia? Will we deliver? It's more, uh, it's more coming out of um, anxiety of not seeing what would happen in future. And, uh, and Greenfield of this size in telecom has not happened, you know, if you look at, you don't see this kind of operation. So therefore, typically you don't have that view about what's going to happen in three years from now, what's going to happen five years from now. Management is saying, but do you have the confidence? I think it's our, in our gift to execute Ethiopia in a way that key milestones are achieved and tell our investors that uh, we are on track and that's what you're doing. So my thing, are you worried? Of course, we are not happy about it. Are you doing the right thing? As a management, you're trying to do the right thing to make sure that which is in our control, uh, we deliver.